Mismor le David, Adonai roi lo yaksar, Vinote she yarbitseini, Nav nafshi venecho jenohaleini, Nafshi yashavev yoncheni vimaglei tzedek, Leman shemo. Gam ki elech begeit salamavet lo yirara ki ata imadi shiftecha omishan techa heima yenachamuni taroch lefanai shulchan neget zorerai. Dishanta Bashem Roshi Kosi Revaya Achtova Cheser Yerefuni Kolyame Chayai Veshaptu Vedadonai Leo Rechiamim The Lord is my shepherd, <clears throat> I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. <clears throat> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, <clears throat> for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're gathered here today with a great weight in our hearts and tremendous sadness as we seek to comprehend to understand and to accept the passing of Marilyn Fowler beloved mother and sister and friend teacher Marilyn's passing this week came unexpected, very suddenly. And it is difficult to come to grips with her being gone. We are left to contemplate the many gifts of her life, the ways in which she touched each one of us gathered here. To draw comfort from those memories and from each other. I'd like to call upon each of Marilyn's children who are going to share some words with us. I'm going to call upon them <clears throat> um, in birth order, so as not to be discriminatory. Uh, Brian first, and then Sarah, and then Becky. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today to honor mom's memory. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. What I probably got the most from my mother was my pride. I mean, we're here in a Jewish funeral home it is, is my sense of Judaism. At one point in my life, I joked about being a stand-up comedian, and I might always said that my opening line would be, I'm left-handed, I'm Jewish, I'm five, six and a half, and, and I'm a Cleveland sports fan, and people wonder why I have an inferiority complex. So, but ever since, you know, first grade, and Mrs. Kane will vouch for me on this, when I was pushed as a little crying six-year-old, I had issues back then. Some people still think I have them now, but that's not the point. Um, <laughs> took me... Um, pushed me down the aisle as a 
blubbering, crying mess, and then but there's still the, the big picture of me with the with the big smile on my face with the consecration cra- class circa 1981, and um, a big thing for me like would be for Passover, especially the last few years being around. Um, when you're around all your employees that are, you know they're all like, why can't you eat bread, Brian? It's like why it's like. We didn't have time for the didn't have time for the uh, our ancestors didn't have time for the uh, bread to rise when they were getting out of Egypt after the tenth plague. So they left in a they, they had to get somewhere. They're in a little bit of a hurry. So it's just it's always been free, like especially around one like third grade was when we started going to Hebrew school. And every Monday and Wednesday, I'd have to hear my name on the PA. You know, you know Mrs. Mrs. Hurst, Brian Fowler to the office, please and everyone looks at you kind of strangely and you go on and then Monday and Wednesday from third grade till seventh grade I would go to Hebrew school and right after that I was bar mitzvah and my bar mitzvah was a very big deal at the time because I think at the moment I was one of maybe three people that had actually got to do the entire service and we normally what we do is called a mo- uh, it's called a mafter it's like the very last portion you read in the Torah but I read um, I believe I be- read the entire. Even I think we're egalitarian, if memory serves me correctly. I read the entire thing with a little help from my grandfather, and my and my dad, and we did all that. Did a half Torah, and a funny thing about that was maybe I think two or three days before I was supposed to be over, and I had about nine months of training to get ready for this. They never taught me the after ble- the after the blessings. I had to basically learn them, you know within record pretty much record time but we took care of that and it went really well it's it's just like I've always had you know pride in being a chosen person to be you know being a Jewish person one of the reasons the casket's here we liked it it's a star David on it to you know at least make hey this makes it even more near and dear to your heart so as you know she's been most of you know she's been suffering the last few months and she's in a better place now and just again I thank you all for coming and you know I'll you know I'll always have the memories of Passover of Hanukkah which was a very very big deal in our house holidays are a very big deal in our house and the chronological order we went from youngest to oldest starting with my cousin Ben and going to my grandfather that was a very that was that was our holiday and then and how I would and then to when my friend Jason when we'd go down and spend Christmas with them every year growing up to be you know to be with their holiday and just it's one of my best childhood memories so um that's you know that's where she's probably touched me you know the most is just you know to be proud of the fact that you know even in this world with all the hate with all the everything you see in this world's you know not is this kind of scary right now to be honest but at least you know you can take pride in hey I was raised Jewish and everything like that and I'll always be proud of that so I'll turn it over to my sister Sarah and to my mother. Rest in peace. You're in a better place now. Hello. Hi, Mom. My words are simple. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us your entire life to our well-being. Thank you for being close to me, no matter how far away I've been. You've been close to me, and you loved us. You always loved us. Thank you. wrote a book. I couldn't find words. And then 
when they started to come, I just kept writing. Uh, I was maybe probably the closest to my mother. Um, so I'm going to take you guys back to the good old 80s. Uh, my mother and I have had a very special and unique relationship since the day I was born. She swore she was going to have me in the car. However, I had a surprise for her. The umbilical cord was hanging too low, and a guy on her team told her that he couldn't guarantee the quality of the child she was about to bear. I'm fairly certain he was fired after he was ejected from the delivery room. Sorry, man. Turns out the umbilical cord was around my feet and not my neck. She was rushed for emergency C-section, and here I am, standing before you today. Throughout my childhood, and even my adult life, if I ever muttered, how are you my mother, she would snarkily retort, sorry kid, you belong to me. I have scars. You want to see? My mom never held anything back. If she was mad, you knew. We had rules and regulations, and we followed them because that's what good, respectful children do. And I can't thank her enough for that. One of my greatest things that I learned for her is that she taught me how to cook and bake, and she never turned me away from the kitchen. That was our thing. Anyone who has ever received a tray of cookies at the holidays knows the love and attention to detail each of these trays had. She encouraged and supported my Cookie of the Month Club. But sadly, my only real client was my aunt and uncle, and that only lasted a couple months. She always made us a handmade cake for our birthday. And I will proudly carry out that tradition. She knew never to bring me a giant eagle cake. She taught me how to make matzo ball soup, and we learned how to really fluff up the matzo balls. She always said, and Grandma, please forgive me, they can't be golf balls like Grandma's. <laughs> I am sorry, Grandma. They were totally golf balls. I would cut, or she would cut, and I would cook, and she always referred to herself as my sous chef. She taught me about the importance of being pampered. I remember so clearly, I was 24, I was sitting at the kitchen table, and she looked at me and said, your eyebrows look terrible. <laughs> she promptly picked up the phone, she made me a wax appointment, and I have never turned back. <laughs> that was 15 years ago. She absolutely loved Manny's and Petty's. It was almost too easy to shop for her for any occasion. She just wanted to be pampered at the salon. It's all she ever needed. Most of all, she taught me to pursue my passions. She knew long ago, at 18 months to be exact, that I would be the incredible artist that I am today. Sure, she had to repaint that wall after I colored it with black crayon, but it's okay. She knew I was just expressing myself. Speaking of crafts, did you know I could run an underground craft store out of my mom's basement? We loved to shop after Sunday school and really any time for knickknacks, tchotchkes, anything that had a bike or a butterfly or anything holiday related. We would always pick up everything I needed as well. And especially with my latest passion of yarn, there's a lot. She was so proud of everything I created and she proudly wore button bracelets and beaded bracelets with pony beads and her keychain was never without some kind of something I made at camp. 
time spent together was my mom's greatest gift to me. It didn't matter if we were folding laundry and watching a movie or hitting every store on the block. It didn't matter if she was falling asleep in her chair or having a dialysis session. It was very important to me to be by her every day. And for the most part, I was. I loved it, even when it was frustrating and hard. I needed her as much as she needed me. So I know that my mom would have loved to share her infinite wisdom with all of you. So I came up with some rules for life that she followed. Be bold. Put that glitter coat on your blue nail polish. If you want purple hair, do it. If anyone tells me that I'm wearing something that my mother would wear, I know I made a good choice. And buying diamonds will always make you feel better. <laughs> be proud. Nobody has to be a doctor to be proud of your accomplishments. If you try your best and you fail, that's life. At least you tried. Most of all, love your family. None of us are perfect. We all make stupid decisions and bad choices. But your family will always be there whether you want them to be or not. This doesn't just include blood, but the people who have been there through thick and thin and would stop a train to help you like my mom would have done for me. Nothing can bring my mom back to me, and nothing is going to stop this hurt I feel in every cell of my body. But I love my mom so much, and if I can emulate even an ounce of her, then the people around me will be as blessed as I am. Becky, Sarah, and Brian, <coughs> really beautiful words, very touching. You paint a beautiful picture of your mother and what she meant to you. The rabbis say that words which come from the heart enter the heart, and your words penetrate our heart on this day. I ask you please to bear with me as you hear. I've got a bit of a cold, so doing the best I can, and hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to hear and understand as I speak. The rabbis tell a beautiful story. <coughs> they say that once upon a time, God spoke to one of his angels and sent that angel on a mission to earth. God said, go down to earth and find for me the three most beautiful and precious things and bring them back to me. So the angel came down to this world and wandered the globe seeking those three most precious things. When first I stumbled upon a flower, a beautiful red rose, and thinking it divinely beautiful, the angel took the rose to heaven. The angel returned and continued on its journey, seeking out that second most precious thing. When it heard the sound of a baby through a window, and looking inside it saw the baby smile, and said, oh, that is so precious. And the angel took the baby's smile to heaven. And then the angel returned to the world yet again, and circling the globe over and over, sought out that third most precious thing. It had almost given up when it came upon what it knew was certainly the most precious of all. And that was a mother devotedly going about her work, expressing her love for her children. And the angel took the mother's love to heaven. And God said, all of these are beautiful, but indeed the most precious of all is the mother's love. There is nothing like the love a mother has for her children, the devotion, the dedication, the loyalty, the protective care, the nurturing, the empowering, the inspiring, the supporting. Our mothers are responsible for much of who we are. And Marilyn was 
the Supreme Mother, so deeply devoted to all three of you. And we remember her today for that love. And love not only for the three of you, but for her sister Maxine, the other members of the family, for friends and co-teachers and co-workers. Because Marilyn was filled with a great deal of love. Marilyn was a loving daughter to Harry and Eleanor, both of blessed memory. A loving sister to Nancy of blessed memory and to David, to you, Maxine, and to you, John. And such a loving, devoted, proud mother of the three of you, Brian, Sarah, and Becky. Maxine, you and Marilyn were four and a half years apart. And that meant you didn't share the same school experiences or the same circles of friends. But you shared a beautiful relationship as you grew. And as we sat together yesterday, you shared with us some very beautiful stories, memories of how you and your sisters would all sit on the porch with your dad to watch the thunderstorms. And how you would join with the other kids in the neighborhood to put on plays. You recalled Marilyn's first car, a Dodge Charger Super B, a sports car. She loved that car, though she always wanted a Jag. And you shared fond memories of family trips to the Bahamas, where you told me you were allowed to gamble, and to DC, where I think it was Marilyn's suitcase that fell open and the hair rollers fell out. We know how much you love Marilyn, how difficult this loss is. Our hearts go out to you, and we pray that God should send you comfort and healing and strength in the days ahead. Marilyn attended Kent State University, where she majored in education, pursuing training in what would be for her a lifelong passion for teaching. But she pulled back from work to raise her children when they were young. Later, when life took a difficult and unexpected turn, Marilyn went back to work. It was at that time she started working at Miscellaneous in Severance, and also at one point ran a daycare out of her home. It was there at Miscellaneous, Sue, that she first met you, and the two of you have enjoyed a lifelong friendship You ended up being the teacher of Marilyn's children in religious school, and ultimately a colleague to Becky as well, and of course, a colleague for decades to Marilyn. Marilyn taught in our school for many decades and inspired generations of young children who grew up to be adults with a love of Judaism and synagogue and strong Hebrew skills that had their foundation in those young classes. Later in life, she also worked for 20 years at Edward Jones as well, where she had a wonderful career. More than an employee, she and her family became close with the family of the person for whom she worked. Becky, you shared that you even babysat for them. Despite the challenges that she faced, she rebuilt her life. Marilyn demonstrated that in difficult times, you have to be strong and resilient and she was a tower of strength. Indeed, she faced more challenges than most in her life, perhaps most especially over this past year, these past months. But she was a determined optimist and a fighter who never gave up and always found the way to move forward. And she taught you, her family, how to face life with the same resilience and determination, how to adapt, how to overcome. Family was everything to Marilyn. And the family built their celebrations around holidays. After all, most of their birthdays each fell near or on a major Jewish or secular or sometimes Christian holiday. And so there were gatherings for Passover, for Seder, Hanukkah gatherings that Brian mentioned, summer barbecues on the deck. So many wonderful memories of those gatherings, of times together as an extended family, like those trips to Giaga Lake, Becky, 
at one of those Geauga Lake trips, you won the watermelon eating contest. Not only that, but at that very contest where you won at Geauga Lake, that's where Maxine and John met each other. And Maxine stood on a table and he noticed her, having come for the men's club trip to Geauga Lake. Memories of Sarah teaching Becky to drive in the synagogue parking lot while Marilyn was teaching or in her teacher meetings, how you would kind of uh, struggle around the lot. Marilyn first came to teach at B'nai Shuren in 1982 or 1983. She taught for us for, I don't know the exact number, but some 30 years. She was incredibly beloved by both children and their parents. Many still will come and see you, Becky, and comment on having your mom as a teacher and what that meant to them. She was always extremely creative, incorporating arts and crafts into her room, and she had a knack for paying attention to the different needs of each child. As the kids grew, Sarah and Becky, you were both aides in her classroom. And Becky, you were also a shadow for students with special needs and often a substitute. And eventually you too became a teacher in our school. In fact, you started so young that you've now been in our school on staff, that is, for 25 years. You started as your mom's aide, and after she retired, she came back to be your aide. How beautiful is that? How that circle was completed. And it was a special experience for the two of you to be able to work together again in the classroom and for her to see what a fine teacher you have become in your own right. You shared that over the years, when she was teaching and later when you were, you would prepare lessons and crafts together. And when you taught, you would also talk about every class afterward. She offered you advice and guidance, but you shared that you learned mostly from her by her example. Watching her in the classroom, you were able to learn things you can't learn any other way except by seeing the way she interacted with the students the way she dealt with a particular situation, the way she applied her creativity, the way she created a positive energy in the classroom. And Brian, you went on to do some teaching too in college in Peoria when you led junior congregation on high holidays there. Marilyn loved to read. She loved books <clears throat> later in life, especially those by Nora Roberts. She would sit and read for hours in her green chair with his own lamp you all started out reading in her lap, and then, as you grew, would sit on the floor next to her to read. And because of that, today you are all readers. She loved cats, especially your cat of 16 or 17 years, Buster, do I have the name right? Who was a very beloved part of the family. She loved the Beatles and had all their albums, and would never miss an opportunity to watch them when they were on TV. She loved the movies, and Santa Claus and Halloween, yes, it's true. And she loved collecting anything that was in the shape of or had on it a bicycle. Paintings, photos, figurines, shaped like a bike. And as you heard from Becky, she loved to shop and shop and shop and shop for anything. For teaching supplies, for crafts, for food, for clothes, for gifts. And Becky, the two of you enjoyed so many shopping outings together and Sarah, when you would come into town, you enjoyed also wonderful, special shopping outings together with your mom. Marilyn was a power shopper. She would set a budget with you, use all kinds of coupons, and come away with much more value than what you had spent every time. She loved fashion. You said to me she, that you could come at her with a curling iron when you were eight, and that was fine with her. She had all kinds of makeup in the house. She didn't use all of it, but it was all there. And Sarah and Becky, you, together with your mom, used to paint your nails the craziest of colors. Brian, I don't think you were a part of that. <laughs> You've already heard that Marilyn was a strict mother with many, as Becky said, rules and regulations. And she could also at times be stubborn. But she was so very devoted to each of you. She loved you so much. She was so proud of you. 
and she wanted the best for each of you always. And she also expected the best from you because she knew what you were capable of doing and accomplishing. It was also important to her to instill in you a strong Jewish identity, a love of learning and solid Jewish values to guide your life. She taught you by example living those values. She was not ritually observant, but she had a deep love and attachment to Jewish tradition and customs, to celebration of holidays and to synagogue. Her home was filled with Jewish things, mezuzahs, seder plates, a huge collection of menorahs. And she also had a deep love of Israel. In fact, she got to travel there in the 90s, right before the Gulf War. And that trip was very meaningful to her. While she was there, and she would call home, and the distance was a little hard on you, I think. I know, I think what Becky talked about crying on the phone because the distance was hard. She brought back special gifts for each of you. Sarah, she brought you back a necklace. And Becky, she brought you back a menorah. And Brian, a shofar. She devoted great efforts to make sure that you had a solid and proud Jewish identity. There are not a lot of Jews living in Stowe and not a lot of Jews in the school there, which makes it more difficult to be a young Jewish child there than, say, in Beechwood. But your mom made sure you were supported and that you would be accepted. Though the school did not have a lot of Jewish children, she went on a crusade to make sure that Hanukkah was included in the holiday celebrations at school. And so strong was she in that crusade and so successful. Then when the school choir would come caroling through the neighborhood, they would stop at the house before yours and sing Christmas songs, and then stop at your house and sing only Jewish songs before they went on to the next house to return to their Christmas carols. She brought you regularly to religious school up in Eshuan. She used to say that if she can get there with you from Stowe, then anyone can get there. And no one had excuse for not being in religious school. And she taught you other Jewish values by example as well. For example, she brought your grandmother into the home and cared for her as long as possible. And when she did need to go to Menorah Park, she took you there every Sunday to be with her. In doing so, she taught you the meaning of kibbutz em, of what it means to honor your mother. And you, in turn, were lovingly supportive of her. She succeeded in transmitting all these values to you because she didn't just preach them at you, she lived them. She set an example for you. And as a result, each of you has a deep love of Judaism and are guided by Jewish values and menschlichkeit and a love of family in the way that you live. Yes, Marilyn could be strict. But that strict nature was balanced out by her total trust in you and her support of whatever you wanted to do, her empowering you to make your own decisions in life, to choose your own path and your own adventures. Sarah, when in high school you decided to go to Mexico, she supported you in that decision. And she continued to do so, even though that wasn't the last, but many similar decisions followed as you traveled and lived around the world through Latin America up to San Francisco, she always, always encouraged and supported you following your path. And in fact, you shared, Sarah, that your mom lived vicariously with you as well through those travels. Each time you traveled somewhere new, she would research it and add the information and pictures to her special travel notebook. She trusted you, and she let you seek out your own adventures, no matter how far away they were. And the same way, Becky and Brian, she always supported you in all that you did as well. She encouraged you to find your own path. Becky, she took such pride in you being a teacher. And Brian, she was so happy for you that you have found your career path. She was so extraordinarily proud of all three of you. There just aren't words to say how difficult it is to lose your mother at such an early age. The gaping hole that leaves. I know that each of you grieve today not only for what you lost that has been, but also for what you lost that could have been. For the future experiences shared, for the future guidance and inspiration but I promise you, your mom will always be with you. You always will feel her in your heart. 
know that she's there to comfort and encourage, to empower and support, to guide and to inspire. Your mother leaves behind for you a rich legacy. She taught you the importance of strength, resilience, and adaptability. She taught you the importance of family. She taught you the importance of a proud Jewish identity and a love of Israel. She taught you what it means to live as I mentioned, to live by Jewish values, to treat everyone around you with kindness and with love. She taught you to have a love of reading and education and a can-do spirit, always ready to take on new challenges and experiences. Perhaps most of all, she implanted within each of you an abiding love of each other. And that was her supreme gift to you. And that was the secret motive behind everything else. To make sure the three of you would have strong bonds between you that would carry you forward through life together. To always be able to support each other. To nurture each other, even when she's not here. You know, it used to be the case, maybe it still is, that when a person would go on a date and the person they were dating would give them a flower. They would take that flower and put it inside of a book to press it. You put it in the book and you set it on the shelf and you forget about it for some length of time and then years go by and you remember that the flower is there and you open up the book to look for it and you turn the page and there is the flower and it's all flattened, and it's dry, and it's desiccated. But is that flower dead? That flower is not dead. That flower is alive. Alive with the memories of the love that was shared, of the time spent together. So you take the flower and you hold it close and you inhale the fragrance that is left. You can still smell the smell of that relationship. And then you take the flower and you press it against your heart. Take your memories of your mom and press them against your heart. She is not dead. She lives on. Judaism teaches that the body dies but the soul lives on eternally. In heaven, in the spirit of the cosmos and in our hearts. And she will always be there to watch over you and to nurture you and to speak to you inside. So take those memories and press them and hold them close to your heart. Let them always bring you comfort. May you always be nurtured by her love. May her memory always be for a blessing. And we say it together, amen. We'll rise now for the memorial prayer. En male rachamim, shochein b'meromim, hametzayim enuchan echonam, tachad kanfei ashechinam, b'malot kadoshim etorim. Kezohar harakia mazhirim Er nishmat Ma shabad hersh vel yanata Shalcha le yolamaham Began eiden Tehem enuchatam Ahana Bal harachamim אז תראה בסדק נפך אל העולמים וצרור בצרור החיים את נשמתם אדוני הוא נחלתה ותנוח בשלום על משכבה ונאמר רמי 
exalted, compassionate God. We pray that you grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of our beloved Marilyn who has gone to her eternal home. A merciful one, we ask that she find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May her soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. May the Lord be her portion. May she rest in peace. And let us say together, Amen. Interment will follow at B'nai Sharon's Chesterland Cemetery on 306. And after which the family will return to B'nai Sharon congregation at the corner of Fairmont and Brainerd and Pepper Pike to sit Shiva through 7.30 this evening. We are invited to come and be with them to offer them comfort. Those that wish to make contributions in Maryland's memory can contribute to the American Diabetes Association or the Kidney Foundation.